Whether or not patients' perceptions of healthcare should be shaped by portrayals in entertainment, there's no escaping the fact that this fictional content has an impact. Unlike treating one patient and impacting one person at a time, I get to help create stories that tens of millions of people watch every week. And you can actually have a pretty large impact. And it's kind of a dangerous thing, too, because if you show things on television that aren't as accurate, the problem is that you're misinforming a pretty large population. That's Michael Metzner, MD. In part one of this episode of Moving Medicine, a podcast from the American Medical Association, Dr. Metzner is joined by Jean M. Farnan, MD, MHPE, to discuss the effect of entertainment and social media's portrayals of medicine. I'm your host, Todd Unger, Chief Experience Officer at the American Medical Association. Here's part one of the discussion. Our first moderated question is for Dr. Metzner. Um, How do you balance giving a factual account of a medical topic while working within their allotted time limit and fitting it within a dramatic narrative? How do you approach what content to include in terms of the medical depth with the time that you're given? I get this question a lot. I think I have one of the best jobs in the world uh, because... You know, unlike treating one patient and impacting one person at a time, I get to help create stories that tens of millions of people watch every week. And you can actually have a pretty large impact. And it's kind of a dangerous thing, too, because if you show things on television that aren't as accurate, the problem is that you're misinforming pretty large population and they come to their doctor and they're like, well, I saw it on Grey's Anatomy. So uh, this is actually a really important question and something that our team at Grey's um, cares a lot about. Uh, You can watch a lot of television shows and being healthcare providers or with medical school, uh, a lot of times you're like, that's never going to happen. But you'd be surprised. Actually, we have a team of physicians who work on Grey's Anatomy, me being one. uh, We have four full-time doctors, four consultants in all different specialties, and then we actually work with experts around the world. So although you might say, oh, that's never going to happen, Almost 99.9% are actually based off of case reports, where yes, it is that one in a million. Yes, it's probably the one in a million in the one in a million, but a a lot of times it actually has happened, which a lot of people are surprised when they hear that. But anytime I'm asked this question, it comes down to there has to be a balance between drama and reality in medicine. You know, we have all these people who watch the show, and if we were to follow the real protocols of what we do, of let's say, if we were looking at the immunofluorescence of a biopsy sample, which takes eight hours in order to produce a result, we wouldn't have a million people watching the show, right? So we have to make it very dramatic and engaging, but we also try and create, uh, you know, it rooted within science. So uh, that. It's something that we're always working on. Um, yes, we do ch- time jumps of what would be in reality. You know, someone who's extubated minutes after they just had an open heart surgery. You know, sometimes it can happen, but on our show it always happens because they have to speak. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we, we do, though. Uh, it, is, it is a fine balance. And um, the way that we come up with the stories, actually, we'll either have writers who have read something uh, on BuzzFeed or in the New York Times, and then we'll, we'll delve in to see what the validity of that is. Or for the stories, we have our own experiences. A couple of the stories this past season were actually based on patients that I had uh, in San Antonio. So again, it's a balance, and it's a very hard, uh, teeter-tottering kind of thing to do, but we do our best. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Nice, thanks. Um, so this next question is for Dr. Farnan. Uh How can we use social media as a platform to connect to a wider, non-medically oriented audience while still maintaining accuracy and professionalism. I think it's really ironic. And when I think about, you know, you guys are rising M2s, you finished, your, you graduated med school in 2016. Um, the, the evolution of the topic around social media and physicians and professionalism has really, I think, has had sort of a meteoric acceleration. When I started doing this work, you know, circa 2008, um, my interest in the area actually started because of a video that our medical students, then rising M2s, had produced and posted on YouTube um, to the shock 
and awe of many faculty at the university, including the Alumni Association, um, which re required a lot of response. And um, and now, you know, just in you know nine years, ten years, the the sort of evolution of the presence of medical students on social media has really exploded and changed a lot. And so, and I think that the initial sort of policy statements and positions of medical schools was very much one of punitive approach and you know sort of keeping students aware of what their presence should be and I think now we're really evolving into thinking about you know how do we really encourage students to become not only you know physicians and scholars and educators but also advocates and social media has been I think an incredibly powerful tool for advocacy so in terms of your um, so in terms of your question so you know how do we encourage students to be you know take a role in the conversations that are happening on whatever platform you're using um, in a way that's both professional and also a way that ac accurately represents information. Um, I think first, is, first and foremost is to take a step back and think about you know what you're putting out there yourself and how you are doing it. And I will say that you know one thing that's different about being a physician, and I know you all are at sort of various levels of training, is that you, you know we don't get to take it off when we leave, right? So you know there's only like two professions where you theoretically quote, quote unquote change your name, right? And it's like the priesthood or the clergy and, and being a physician, right? And you are Dr. So-and-so in the hospital and Dr. So-and-so outside of the hospital. And it very much impacts the representation and how people interpret our messages. So I do think that thinking about what you're posting and in what role you are posting it in, right? Are you posting it as a medical student or are you posting it as, you know, an individual who happens to feel one way or another about a certain, you know, social or political issue? You have to very, be very thoughtful about that. I think it is much more expected now that, that students do engage and that it becomes less of this concern of, oh, you know, residency programs are screening social media to see, you know, who's posting inappropriate things on Facebook and nobody's on Facebook anymore. Um, but, you know, the idea that, you know, the things that you're putting out there may negatively impact you, um, I think that that, is, that ship has sailed and we're really thinking about how do we use social media as a tool to unite students and to really unite folks across the world around around really important issues. Um, you know, hashtag women in medicine, hashtag I look like a surgeon. Like there's lots of really important initiatives that have developed that have been grassroots for students. Um, accuracy is an issue, right? And so, you know, making sure that you're posting evidence-based information um, and, you know, being very thoughtful about obviously providing medical advice by a certain m means is, you know, is, is complicated. But I think that, you know, really encouraging students to maintain a voice because I think that in the absence of a voice from, you know, whether it's the AMA as like a large organization, individual faculty, or students, without a voice from the physician community, we leave a void that is filled with misinformation. Um, and so I think encouraging students to embrace that position and really and be out there and pre proactive is important. Yeah. I really feel that like I'll, some some friend will ask me a question about something medically related. I'll be like, I don't know, it's probably this. And then like as I get further into med school, I'm thinking, I hope they don't like actually take my advice. <laughs> like when I just recklessly didn't think about it and said something. <laughs> yeah. So thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. Go ahead, Jones. So this next question is actually for both of you. Um, how do you approach trying to cover a more ethically sensitive topic? Maybe something along the lines of physician-assisted suicide or abortion or any kind of ethically sensitive topic. So we actually, I don't know, how many of you have watched Grey's Anatomy? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so we probably all have watched that at some point in our life. Anyone still watch Grey's Anatomy? Okay. So this season, I think we did one of the most amazing jobs on a really sensitive topic. And if you haven't watched this episode, I'm, I'm pushing the show on you right now, but you, you have to go watch it. It's called Silent All These Years. And it follows this woman who was sexually abused. Um, her husband was out of town. She was out drinking with her friend. She was walking home, and then she was raped in an alley. And, you know, when we talk about these kind of sensitive issues, and we've, act, of course, Gray's, we try and push the limit as much as we can, but this was a really important story. We did so much research. We spoke to so many survivors. We engaged so many organizations that focus on what are the needs for, for these kind of survivors. And we created a story that, to this day, and I don't know how we're ever going to beat it, like, it was the most remarkable piece of television entertainment 
topic that I've ever had. I, I was so happy and humbled to be part of this team to create that story. And from that story, uh, other than we're now being considered for an Emmy nomination, which is awesome, 15 years later. But um, <laughs> Medicine doesn't stand still, and neither do we. AMA members don't just keep up with medicine, they shape its future. Help move medicine, join the movement. Visit ama-assn.org slash movingmedicine. This story, the day after the RAIN, associ Rain Association, which is uh, its rape, abuse, incest uh, network, um, their calls actually increased by 43% after we showed that. And we've just had so much outreach from women and men who have been victims. And so when, we're, when we talk about these kind of topics, it's not just, oh, we're gonna write a really compelling story. We do so much research uh, to make sure that what we're conveying is important. And we actually did a, um, a uh, what are they called? The public service announcement, PSA kind of thing actually as a trigger warning even before we put this on primetime television uh, because we showed every step of what actually goes into a rape kit. It's the first time in TV history that we went through each of those steps. And watching it, I've probably seen it about eight times now and every time I'm like choked up. But um, the power of that and empowering those survivors is it's just amazing that we have that, we have that modality to reach so many people. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, same question for you, Dr. It's a little bit more complicated, I think, for the individual student and, you know, ethically charged and sensitive issues come up constantly, right? And I think that we're all very aware of, you know, the current conversations about reproductive health rights um, and a lot of, you know, other conversations. I mean, the, you know, the, the discussion on social media right now about the protest that's going to happen here tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I think the issues about universal payer. Um, and so I think that for an individual student, you know, it's a little bit more difficult um, when you try to navigate these waters because they really are issues of representation. Um, and there are actually legal precedents about, you know, what an individual student can do um, for, you know, in their role as a student of X institution. How many of your schools allow you to protest with your white coats that are, that are branded? I see some heads shaking no. So some schools, some schools allow students to protest with their branded medical school white coats. How many students are at schools where your, your administration has told you you are not allowed to wear branded materials um, to do protests or any other kind of political action? So there's, there's several of you. And, and a lot of that has to do with you know, state-based schools versus private schools and federal funding versus not. Um, students at private institutions have a little bit more leeway because they're not um, as, as bound to federal tax dollars, however, Again, the idea that what you believe as an individual cannot be censored by um, your individual institution, although the messages that you do put out there can be, you know, everyone talks, or talks about the First Amendment and the freedom of speech, and, um, but they actually are, it's more so freedom of expression. Um, and the idea that um, this is actually really interesting legal precedence about what's called the material and substantial disruption test, which actually came from a, a verdict back in the 60s about protests against the Vietnam War. And so, you know, if what you are doing is substantially disruptive enough to the rest of your classmates to impact their education, then, then the school can actually sort of rein in the message that you send. So having all that context in the background, I think it's very important to you know, make sure that you understand what the policies are at your individual institutions. I, I'm sure you know if you follow anybody who's present, um, who's very active on you know, Twitter or any other social media platform, you'll often see like tweets are my own and do not represent the views of my employer. I think every single person sort of has that in their, in their byline so that, that individuals are aware that you know, these are my pers you know, personal political viewpoints. I think also if you are kind of wading into that water of you know, social media, how, what do you want to put out there? Do you want to put everything out there? Some people keep their personal um, and their professional identities very separate. You know, maybe I don't want everybody, you know, following me to see my son's graduation, you know, or like how I feel about baseball because in Chicago that's very polarizing. Um, and so, go White Sox. And so, um, you know, you have to make those decisions, I think, you know, before you are sort of deciding to kind of wait, you know, get into that water. But once you do decide, then I think that, you know, being true to what you believe is incredibly important. And, you know, really having authentic, you know, 
participation in whatever thing it is that you are passionate about. And I think this is really going to be what moves us forward as a community of physicians. I mean, there are a lot of things right now that are, you know, in the in the ether of, you know, social media that people are discussing and people are not afraid to share their views about it. And I think that I would encourage all of you to once you sort of know, you know, what your policy-based limitations are at your individual schools is to advocate as strongly as you want for things that you believe in because I think that that is really important because we should advocate for not only ourselves and our personal views but advocate for our patients which is the most important thing. So this is another question for both of you. Uh, so pertaining to how media and like big media such as Grey's Anatomy and even our personal social media um, can affect public perceptions or patient attitudes. Um, how do you view the impact of media in, in like, in terms of, I'm thinking in terms of chronic illness or terminal illness or uh, things where we take this, uh, there's generally an approach that like we need to be fighters and we need to like go for it and give it all we got. Like um, I, a specific example I'm thinking of is Alex Trebek recently was diagnosed with stage four pancreatic cancer. Uh, people with his condition, about 9% have a, a good outcome don't aren't, aren't killed by it immediately, um, and his his immediate reaction was I'm going to fight fight with it, uh, and he thankfully managed to to and he's, I think he's in remission right now if I if my news is correct or something, yeah. um, but so for something like this we have we have so much emphasis on being a fighter uh, when when is it appropriate to do we do we overdo that. Um, do we, yeah, I don't know. What are your thoughts? Well, you know, I'm, on Gray's, we're storytellers. So I have examples where I could give you for both. You know, we have that patient who, no matter what, you know, they're, they're going to fight for their life and whether or not, you know, they make it or not, depending on that story. But we also have, there was a, another uh, patient this season where we, she was in a, she actually fell off a balcony. She was a day before her wedding. Uh, she ended up having her wedding in the ICU as they were taking her off life support. Uh, so, yeah, I know, very dramatic, but trust me, you watch that and you things. try to keep a dry eye. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, to your question, I think it is important to show that story of, of both sides of the coin. I think uh, as a society, uh, I'm sure we'd all agree, a lot of people believe that, you know, this is one of the biggest problems within healthcare right now is that most of the cost is in that last six months of life. And we have the mentality that we have to fight no matter what, we have to do every measure that we can. Uh, being a general surgery resident, I would see this all the time, where you'd have just the most dire situation, and the patient was 89 years old, has dementia. Their quality of life wasn't there, but then the family is like, nope, we want them to do an X lap, and we want them to you know, do everything possible in order to save them. So you know, I think, I think it is a big issue right now, um, just within society as general, um, and we can use modalities like Gray's uh, in order to kind of talk about those. I think hope is a powerful thing. Um, and I think it's, I also think that there are, I'm not an oncologist, but you know, several of my colleagues who are, have very strong feelings about the idea of like the battle against cancer, right? Because it implies that if there's a fight that someone loses in yeah. and um, it, it's not, I think more importantly in terms of social media, it, it's less the idea perhaps of people with, um, terminal illness, but I think the big concern really is around areas of chronic illness, and I think specifically thinking about, you know, in the context of the sort of opioid crisis, which is a big, obviously hot topic right now that's being discussed, the idea of um, stereotyping or classifying patients by a diagnosis and, and, and providers and physicians and, and non-physician providers alike sort of having conversations about their impressions of individuals based on interactions I think can be very destructive um, to the physician-patient relationship and can, can cause a lot of distrust. Um, and I think that that can be incredibly problematic. You'll see people kind of vent about their interactions with patients who, for, for example, have chronic pain, who are um, you know, asking for pain medication 
and a lot of suspicion, a lot of cynicism in the community. And I think that that voice is, is one where we're, A, missing the patient voice. Um, and I think it's incredibly important to consider that we should be very much listening to and being proactive about looking for the patient voice, especially in social media and other, and other venues, um, because the individual experience of illness is something that's so important that we don't hear enough of. Um, and I think that you know individual patient groups that where they find one another online and network about their specific diagnoses. I mean, there was a, a thread that I read last night about an individual who is a physician who is um, very active on Twitter, who has a diagnosis, who she said, you know, I don't like emergency room docs to know that I have this disease because it's going to color all of their interactions with me. So I think as a community, we can do better about not trying to put those um, biases into the into the into the sort of the, the community and the discussion. Um, but in terms of things like terminal illness and um, you know discussing how we approach that, I, again, I think it's important to include the patient voice in the conversation um, and also trying to sort of understand each each patient's approach and what their understanding is. I mean, I will say that, you know, patients having access to, you know, the Alex, Googling the Alex Trebek story or like Google just period, you know, people, um, you know, everybody has their, you know, their, their MD, um, you know, from, from, you can, you can get pretty, you know, when you're on the second, third page, page of Google, you know, you're pretty desperate, but, um, you know, people are, have more access, right, than they ever have had before. And the, between, you know, access and social media and the internet and direct to consumer marketing of different drugs um, you know patients have a lot of information and I think it makes a lot of people very uncomfortable um, that patients know so much about things these days and I think it's really important that we figure out how to include the patient voice and the patient experience um, before we sort of kind of throw out into the world what our views are of a disease that was part one of our discussion on the media's impact on patients health care preconceptions I'm Todd Unger, and this is Moving Medicine, a podcast by the American Medical Association. To get exclusive AMA advocacy news and information impacting physicians, patients, and the healthcare environment, subscribe to the AMA Advocacy Update newsletter at ama-assn.org slash advocacy update. You can also subscribe to Moving Medicine and other great AMA podcasts on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and Spotify, or visit ama-assn.org slash podcasts. Thank you for listening.